Thanks for listening. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one coaching with Dr. Lodi, please visit drsudliff.com. I am an American board certified OBGYN, a mom, a Muslim, and I'm talking about sex. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sadaf Lodi. This episode is everything you need to know about education, online education, and comprehensive sex education. Before I get into it, the very first thing I want to make very clear is that this is not any form of medical advice. So in case you're having any type of health-related issues, please speak with your healthcare provider. And this is not any type of religious advice. So if you're having any religious issues, please speak with your friendly neighborhood religious leader. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast because I just happen to be a Muslim woman that speaks about sex. So today I'm super excited to have on with me uh, Mr. Salim Qureshi. And uh, I'm gonna let Salim introduce himself, but Salim and I go way back. We've been friends for a while and he actually introduced me to my husband. So <laughs> we have a, a special bond. But uh, welcome to the podcast, Salim. And uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and where you are and what you started and where you are now. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I, I, I feel honored. <laughs> <laughs> um, so right now I am in uh, Helsinki in Finland. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. So for those of you who are thinking of... Uh, a, a, a getaway, a skiing getaway. This is a perfect, perfect place, and we'd love to host you over here. But the way that I got over here was, um, I said it's been a long journey. Uh, I started off um, in uh, New York, and then I ended up in California. I was studying neurology, um, and uh, my area of interest was the human brain and understanding how to quantify. Uh, I'll get a little technical, but how to quantify action potential within the neurons would actually create thoughts or create, you know, um, memories. But anyway, so uh, that led to our uh, first startup, which was an assessment-based uh, uh, startup. Uh, we had our first exit, and that led to our second startup, uh, which was also in the assessment uh, arena. We would look at uh, developing uh, talent maps. We would look at how uh, the different skill sets that are required in the industry and how the current talent is able to you know, match that. But then we had our second exit, and then we, we decided, okay, you know, now we know everything that we need to know about the brain and how the brain functions. And... Uh, why not take this up a couple of notches and why not feed the brain so when we talk about feeding the brain we're actually you know uh, uh, talking about education and uh, we look at education from a standpoint of feeding content to the brain um, and the more we feed content to the brain we look at we study how the brain then develops you know its thought processes how the brain is able to retain content uh, and then recall content uh, and we've gotten to the online education business, uh, and then we landed up here in, in Helsinki. So that's who we are. In a nutshell, yeah, but uh, you make it sound so easy, and I, I know it, <laughs> it was quite the journey for you, and you've done really a lot of amazing work, Salim. So, you know, just for um, for the people that are not familiar with what you've done, you actually had like a matchmaking service, right? Yeah. In the beginning. And, and you, you worked a lot with that. And then you went over to Stanford and did some more research on the brain. So, you know, what, what would you say that one of the most interesting things that you found out about the human brain in terms of, uh, say, like relationships? Okay. Um, wow. Uh, you take me back several, several years, almost two decades now. So two decades ago, we started a matchmaking right. service. And it was a social experiment. It was really to understand what what makes people click right? and what makes people fall apart so the whole premise of the matchmaking service was how do we prolong a marriage and how do we delay divorce right? so that was that that was the main uh, concern of ours how do we make sure that marriages last and in order to understand how marriages last we really needed to understand how people think and we needed to you know, no pun intended, but get into their brains and really understand 
why is someone going to say yes to, you know, why is John going to say yes to Susan or vice versa? And then once they are into the marriage, you know, a couple of years into the marriage, why would they still stay together? And the way that we classified, uh, you know, uh, this whole metrics was we started uh, allocating points to areas where people would really, you know, connect. And then we started, you know, giving, you know, minus points to where people would really fall apart. And the point system actually worked. So uh, and it became pretty successful uh, until the social until we said to ourselves, you know what, this social experiment is interesting enough. Now we want to really get you know deep and dirty and really start understanding what's going on in the brain. Why are people fighting? You know, why are people quarreling? Why are uh, you know? And then we got you know we got a little more technical and we said, okay, why does a husband and wife or a boyfriend girlfriend quarrel or a partner and partner quarrel? And then why does a mother and uh, child quarrel, right? And then why we we started understanding the issues of quarrels, right? When we understood the issues of quarrels, then it became very easy for us to you know try to see how to make people smile or what do people need to do in order to be happy. So what was your so what did you find out? We found out that everything that we knew was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> So, so then what? <laughs> what did you do? So th then we said that there's no, th there's no one size that fits all, uh, and it's very individual. It's very personal. Um, and then, but then what we did was that okay, we said okay, let's divide these personality types into different categories, right? So um, a lot of you, a lot of your viewers might have heard of you know personality tests and so on and so forth. I'm not a, a big believer in them because they don't necessarily work all the time. But we did classify uh, different brains with respect to how they're able to enjoy, how they're able to be uh, sad, or how they're able to. So again, you know, from a technical standpoint, it's all about dopamine releases. Right? It's about cortisol releases. It's about adrenaline releases. It's about serotonin releases. Um, and different brains, in, put in different situations, uh, have a different uh, trigger mechanism for these kinds of. Um, uh, hormones within the brain and uh, I guess we kind of mastered that whole process uh, to the point whereby we brought that now into education so it becomes very easy for us to if someone is not listening you know how do we get their attention what do we do to get their attention okay if someone is overactive is too hyper right there might be an excess level of adrenaline. So how do we calm that person down? If we look at it from the standpoint of a relationship, when you know when tempers are flying all over the place, how do we bring that level down a little? So and we brought that into education, and, and uh, you know, uh, knock on wood, we're happy to say that we're hugely successful in this. That's fantastic. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because just um, recently I was reading an article and they talked about the dual control mechanism in sexual response and in relationships and basically stating something very similar, right? That there are things that cause us to become stimulated and are turned on. And that's, of course, controlled by the brain. So the more of that thing, whatever it is, uh, if that happens, then the person will, you know, become stimulated, become aroused, and, um, you know, they're, they'll be turned on. Whereas they have something else called that something that inhibits the, that response, right? So you have something like, uh, for example, in Emily Nagoski, she's a, an author that a lot of people know of and heard of, and she wrote the book, Come As You Are. And she talks about the brakes and the accelerator, which is exactly to the dual response, right? So something that causes the brakes, you don't want to do that much of something that causes the accelerator. If that's, you know, if you're trying to be more intimate with your partner, then you, you know, increase those things that result in um, stimulation, result in you getting turned on, things like that, right? So that that's their dual response model. And um, so the brakes and the accelerator. So it's interesting what you talk about, right? And it's, it talks about, and it has to do with the hormones, right? The, the hormones that are released when you're angry it, are a lot of times the fight and flight response, right? That's when you have the adrenaline, you have the cortisol. And those hormones can also be good 
in the other setting, right? When you're trying to be more intimate with your partner. However, you don't need as much of it as you may need in when you're trying to put on the brakes, right? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the hormones that you talked about, um, about, you know, learning and how that also is affected. Okay. So first of all, you brought, brought up something really interesting, right? With respect to uh, intimacy. And I, and I, and I firmly, firmly believe, and I don't have any data to back this up, but I firmly believe that, you know, 90% of intimacy is over here and 10% is down there, right? So it's all got to do with how you are viewing a, a particular situation. And uh, the, um, at the end of the day, everything is determined or controlled by, you know, the type of hormones that are released. And my area of focus is the amygdala. Um, and uh, because uh, that, that's where the major neurotransmitters that, uh, you know, govern uh, uh, things related to some things that you cannot control, you know, uh, that take place. So the hormones that we uh, look at, that we study, in specific with respect to education, are the dopamine hormones, and spe most specifically the dopamine uh, DR4 receptors and how the channels within the synapses open up within the neuron and how the electrical current is able to go from one place to another. Now, again, this is getting a little too technical, but in a nutshell, people start learning or people start understanding when they can connect with that particular content, right? So uh, if the content is presented in an interesting manner that sparks their thought process, then they'll definitely want to learn a little more. Right. And in, lear in learning strategies and learning techniques, our goal is to make sure that our teachers, so we have an online school uh, and the teachers teach online to students and the way, and we teach the, uh, we train our tutors or train our teachers to make sure that they make the content interesting. If the content's not interesting, then no one's going to want to listen. Sure. Uh, yeah. And interesting means you are stimulating a thought process. Interesting means that you're stimulating uh, dopamine. Interesting means that you're stimulating serotonin. And sometimes interesting means you create a little bit of confusion. So you're stimulating cortisol or you're stimulating adrenaline, right? It's about keeping the viewer's attention. Right, right. It's funny that you say that because that all of what you just said mm -hmm can be applied to so many different parts of our lives, right? And especially within a relationship, mm -hmm. right? You want those hormones, you want the serotonin, you want the dopamine, but you also want the excitation, mm -hmm. right? You also want the intrigue, you want the mystery, mm -hmm. you want something that's going to keep your attention, right? Because when people get bored in their relationship, that's when they tend to look outside of the relationship. So how do you, and you know, there's another author, Esther Perel, right? And she, she often talks about how do we want what we already have, right? And so she talks about this uh, erotic intelligence and this emotional intelligence, basically saying that, you know, you have to create a mystery. You have to do things that will inspire and also create a sort of mystery around the person that you've known for so long, right? And that's similar to what you're just talking about in terms of education. How do you keep the child or whoever it is that you're trying to teach, how do you keep them interested? So they're not just all of a sudden zoning out and not really paying attention, yeah. right? And and then you, you know, your team also does something similar, right? Where you think of different ways to keep that attention um, so that you can keep that learning model going. Yeah, so whether, whether it's an intimacy or whether it's in learning, these are both experiences, right? So, or whether it's in any kind of situation. The key over here is to keep the audience or keep uh, keep the viewer or the user interested, right? So you can apply it in intimacy, or you can apply it in a business meeting, right? Or you can apply it in a uh, a learning environment, learning setting. And one of the key things with respect to you know maintaining interest has got to do with engagement. So uh, you know I can speak from the teaching profession. You have to keep the student interested. Right. Now we're developing a lot of very interesting technologies with respect to keeping, you know, uh, or how we keep the brain interested. And what we, so uh, a little while ago, what we did is that we conducted an experiment with about 260 plus uh, students and we wired them up with these EEG devices and we started taking measurements of what's happening in their brain or what's happening with their neural activity as we teach them. 
right? And what this taught, what this showed us is we were able to see through QEG uh, maps where the brain lights up. And when the brain lights up, we're able to see, okay, that is when the neural activity is actually happening, when the student is actually listening. And then we started teaching them boring content. And guess what? Lights out. No one was listening. So through this, we were able to understand how the face, so we were able to uh, monitor the facial uh, expressions as well. And we found a direct correlation between the QEG maps as well as the facial recognition. So now the new technology that we're working on is to have a, um, uh, well, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but for the camera in uh, on your device to measure the facial uh, or monitor the facial expressions and relay this information back to the user uh, on the other end that, hey, you know what? Your sub, your audience is not interested anymore. So spice it up a little, you know. <laughs> Well, that's amazing. You know, I wonder how you could apply that to a relationship, right? Wouldn't that be amazing? Oh, yeah. If you're talking to somebody and all of a sudden you realize that they're zoning out and not even paying attention anymore. And then, and then you, you know, you have to spice it up a little bit, right? Yeah. That's what life. You just gave me an idea. Maybe we can sell this to, to WhatsApp or you know, Skype or all of these other video conferencing calls. Right. That right. people Absolutely. use late at night, you know. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I, you know, I know we've been talking a little bit about education and your online education forum. And really, I'm, I'm very interested to know, you know, how you feel that our countries. So, you know, both you and I come from Pakistan and, um, you know, a lot of times there is a huge taboo in speaking about education, but not so much just general education, right? General education. Pakistanis are very smart, you know, education is placed at a very high value, um, but so much so that um, really it's it's the scholarly education, right? So they're interested in like people becoming like doctors and lawyers and things like that. But I think one area that we don't really talk about much at all, if at all, right, is comprehensive sexual education, which I think is very important. And for everyone, not just right, not just Pakistanis, but everyone throughout the world, but in so many places and not just in developing countries, but also in the U.S., we know that the statistics tell us that we are severely lacking in comprehensive sexual education. And in fact, I just gave a recent talk on this and we know that in the U.S., you know, there's no comprehensive sexual education. Uh, that each state does get funding, but that um, each state gets to decide how and when they present this education and um, whether or not they, you know, do it in whether the information that they're providing is um, research backed scientific evidence or are they just teaching abstinence, right? Are they just teaching that, you know, it's better to wait until marriage, which is a great thing to teach. However, we know based on t statistics and on teenage pregnancies, on intimate partner violence and um, sexually transmitted infections, we know that that message is really not working. And so what's very important for us to do is to start teaching comprehensive sexual education so that you know our adolescents, our teenagers, our young adults can have the information they need so that they can have agency over their own sexual health and wellness. So recently, the Gut Macro Institute and um, the Gut Macro Institute, for those that don't know what it is, it's it's a, a research facility that conducts um, evidence based research backed studies on different parts of the world and also the United States and in regard to comprehensive sexual education and talks about like sexually transmitted infections how old people are when they are learning this information and how they're applying it and whether or not it's making a difference. And they have studied and shown that kids when they were like adolescents, uh, people that were adolescent in 1995 received more information and comprehensive sexual education than those that are now growing up in 2015 through 2019. So they have statistics to show that, that the information that we're teaching children is basically not enough. And that back in 1995, kids were learning more, 
right? They're learning more about how to, for example, put on a condom, how to protect themselves from sexually transmitted infections, how to prevent pregnancy. They also, when they conducted research, they also noted that most children were receiving information on, say, contraception and birth control in their schools. And whereas they were receiving more information about abstinence in their church and in their religious settings, right? And that's really not surprising. But what that tells us is that we are just not providing information to our young adults, right? And our youth. And the research actually that I wanted to mention to you is that they re released this article. Um, and what they noted is that uh, the title of this from the Guttmacher Institute is that more than half of unintended pregnancies among adolescent women in Pakistan end in abortion, which I thought was very interesting. And the statistic that they quote, and this is for 221,000 adolescents aged between the ages of 15 and 19, experiencing unintended pregnancy, um, they show that 58% resulted in abortion, right? 30% more in birth and 12% resulted in either miscarriage or stillbirth. So that says a lot, right? And um, I'm not just saying it just to point out one country. The only reason I'm pointing this out, ba you know, based on um, the country that they had studied, which was Pakistan, and it's very relevant to both you and I because we're both of Pakistani descent. So that leaves us with a huge chasm that needs to be filled. And that, you know, I think that your online education and your online resources could really help in that in promoting comprehensive sexual education. Uh, you know, uh, what you just uh, mentioned over here is very eye opening. Because so we, we are running an online school. Uh, however, until until right now, until you started mentioning this, we had not really thought of you know um, uh, talking about or offering you know such kind of a course. And the statistics that you have just put forward, I think that they are very eye opening, and I think that um, a conversation, an appropriate conversation, which is. Um, which takes into account the local uh, norms and the local culture. Right. Um, I think a, a relevant kind of a course should be developed so that we are able to um, avoid, you know, uh, mishaps uh, like the ones that you've just mentioned, you know, like, like uh, unplanned pregnancies, like abortions, and so on and so forth. So I do believe that there. This is a this is a very very big area, and uh, I think that it needs a lot of uh, work in it. And I think that it is. It's a. I don't think that any work has been done, you know, um, in this particular area that is significant enough. So you know, kudos to you for you know pointing this out. And I think that, uh, um, well, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be trying to study this after this uh, podcast. I'm going to be looking at this and trying to study how can we facilitate a dialogue between the parent and the child, right? Because right. especially if you're coming from the Muslim community, not only the Pakistani community, this is a very personal thing, right? And every family Absolutely. will look at this from a very personal uh, right. Some parents are very progressive, so they would talk about this in, in a more open setting. And some parents are very, very conservative, and it is a complete taboo issue. So the, the, the thing over here is, even though it might be a taboo issue, it needs some kind of a discussion. So what kind of a course or what kind of a discussion or what kind of, uh, you know, town hall, you know, uh, dialogue needs to be started so that, number one, it's respective of the, the local norms, right? Absolutely. And it is, at the same time, providing the relevant information to, uh, to the audience. And I think that young adults, they, you know, it's, uh, I don't have the data or the statistics on this, but I would not be surprised if the, uh, you know, if the majority of the data that is being, uh, uh, that is being generated is not taking into account uh, an individual going onto the internet and exploring stuff by themselves, right? Through various, things, through various sites. And then a lot of these kinds of discussions are happening in chat rooms that are just not being monitored. So data cannot be collected from them, especially when it comes to peer to peer engagement. Right. Um, right. You know, uh, I know for a fact that, uh, you know, sexting is a very, very big uh, epidemic uh, 
within the younger generation. And then, you know, uh, you have all kinds of images that are being, you know, uh, fly, that are flying around from one phone to another and so on and so forth. So instead of having the, uh, I, I think what the Muslim community over here has an opportunity to do is we have an opportunity to address uh, the dialogue that is being take, that is taking place in the peer-to-peer -peer level and bring it into a more mature so that there, it's being discussed with an adult in an adult manner, right? In a mature setting, taking into account the, uh, you know, uh, the local uh, and the cultural uh, intricacies. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that's the whole thing with comprehensive sexual, sexual education, right? Is that it takes into account the cultural norms of that society so that it's sensitive, so that it's not, you know, um, unaware of how a sensitive topic such as physical intimacy needs to be approached, right? And so that's something that whoever teaches that topic has to be very aware of at the same time providing, right, science-backed, evidence-based research and information that people and, you know, teenagers, adolescents, anyone can go and take with them. I mean, you'd be surprised how many people do not know their own anatomy, right? And I come across mm -hmm. that and that this is not in relation to any single, um, you know, uh, group. It is, it's a general, it's a generalization that I see actually in the clinic where I work. And um, a lot of women are not very familiar with their own anatomy, with their own bodies, you know, what is capable of, what happens, things like that. And so that's why it's so important for us to, you know, be transmitting this information regarding comprehensive sexual education, right? And not only just, we don't need to pathologize it, right? So it's not everything awful. It's not all about like, you know, intimate partner violence or sexually transmitted infections or about, um, you know, just unintended pregnancies, things like that. It's, it's about everything. It's a holistic approach, right? It can be, there can be pleasure in it. Um, and within, you know, of course, within Islam, it's within the context of marriage, but there are so many different aspects to this comprehensive sexual education that I think that your online education would be perfect for it. And not only if you were able to create a program such as this, not only would you be able to you know, present it to say Pakistan, but also into the other, you know, countries that I know that you're already part of, like, for example, uh, different countries in Africa that you're looking into, you know, different uh, areas in the Middle East, all over the world, right? So I think you could be the premier um, educational resource for comprehensive sexual education that I think people would be very, very interested in. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, well, you know, um, you know that I have two beautiful little daughters. Uh, one is uh, uh, seven years old, the other one is 12. And um, I think that uh, this, this actually gives me an amazing opportunity to create a course for my own family. Right, so we, so we we are uh, from an education standpoint, we're very progressive. Uh, from a cultural standpoint, we're equally as progressive. But these kinds of conversations have not come up in our household because the time has not come. But I think you know, with a with a daughter who's twelve years old, uh, as in any household, these kinds of conversation, the timing for these kinds of conversations are is fast approaching, and I think that uh, uh, if I create a course for my own daughters, for my own household. Uh, I think that uh, it's something that uh, we'd be able to, you know, extend to other families as well who are um, uh, educationally progressive, but at the same time, they're very culturally conscious of what they want to talk about and what they don't want to talk about. And again, at the, at the end of the day, you see, the human brain it can catch signals very, very quickly. So we don't necessarily need to go into, you know, a lot of graphical detail, right? Uh, rather. A, a very casual dialogue with your kids on such kind of an issue so that they don't feel uncomfortable. You see, the, the, the main thing over here is that if a parent is doing this rather than a school doing it, right, then it becomes that much more effective, right? More importantly, it develops a very strong bond between the parent and the child because you're talking about something that, you know, is just not talked about. 
right? And if it's done, if it's executed in, um, uh, in, in a very nurturing manner, in a very caring manner, in, uh, again, you know, keeping into mind cultural sensitivity, right? If it's done in that particular manner, then I believe that it would really strengthen the bond between the parent and the child. And it does not need to be between, a, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, gender specific. It does not need to be between a mother and a daughter or a father and the son. It could be either way. But this is a part of life. Right? Every, everyone is going to you know, grow up. Everyone's going to get married. Or everyone's going to have kids before marriage or after marriage. Everyone wants companionship. It's a part of life. And just you know, uh, covering that up uh, and not talking about it actually uh, is, it shows our own insecurities. Right? right. So, you know, it's interesting that you say that, Slim, because... Um, you know, I'm a huge proponent for comprehensive sexual education. And I think what's really important is uh, something that you mentioned, which is that when we are able to discuss these issues with our own children, right, when we create the change that we want to see, for example, we want to change the sex negativity that is so prevalent in several societies, not just conservative ones, several societies, right? Um, when we want to change that sex negativity to sex positivity, we have to change within ourselves. So we have to feel comfortable with that topic and with discussing it, right? And so that we also don't pathologize it so that, you know, our children come away thinking that the only time people have sex is, you know, either for procreation or, you know, to prevent pregnancy or abortion or, you know, something like that, right? We want to come at it from a very positive, nurturing, loving uh, type of background so that they themselves create a sex positive um notion and so that they can transmit that sex positivity to their own children. And really, I don't think that there is, I think there is age specific um, way to talk about sex, right? So I don't think that it's necessarily that, um, that there, you know, I think that we can start to talk about anatomy when somebody is young. And so that they learn the proper words for it. Because I think that when we start to use euphemisms, I think that's a problem. What happens is that then if that child, you know, God forbid, is ever um, molested or something happens to them, they're not able to tell the adult that they trust what happened to them because we did not teach them the proper language for it. Right. So that's why I think that it's important. You know, you don't have to get into the intricacies of physical intimacy with a five year old. I don't think that that's appropriate. But I do think that teaching them the proper terminology and words for their different body parts is appropriate at that age. And then right then that leads to a conversation later on as they get older and you can make it age specific so that you know they're not afraid or they don't get you know turned off or i don't know some people are worried that they're going to make you know physical intimacy seem more enticing than what it, whatever you know i i think that there's a lot of baggage there but so you, regardless you may not realize this but you've you've touched upon something so big um yeah. because you see it, well um I love your podcast already. <laughs> Basically, you see, what you've just done in, in, in the last couple of minutes is that you've actually given the template, right, to, for sex positivity, right? Yes. What you've done is that you have very clear, very um, un, maybe unknowingly outlined that the best way for a conservative family to talk about sex positivity is how to protect yourself, all right? And put, and in any conservative family, right, regardless of what religion you might be following, if you educate the parents to educate their kids on how to protect themselves against, you know, molestation, which is a very common, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's very common in, you know, in, in all societies, right? Especially in the conservative society, it's even more common, right? How do you protect yourself? What is a no-no? Right? What's a no-go and what should not be done? And if we start the dialogue from over there, then it gives the parents a little more confidence to go in a little further and discuss the, the, sure. the, 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 the whole topic in a little more detail. 
So I think that uh, at least you've definitely given me an excellent idea for a course. <laughs> <laughs> so we can... I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So appro right, approaching uh, the matter of intimacy from a standpoint of, number one, anatomy and what sh no one should do to you, but, you know, uh, and I think that that particular um, dialogue would, Seg yeah, would be very, very acceptable, uh, regardless of how conservative or progressive, you know, a particular family is. And that's a very good starting point. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, Salim, would you any uh, takeaways or anything like that that you want to leave little pearls for the listeners regarding online education? How can they find you? Where can they get more information? You have people all over the world listening to this podcast, Salim. I, I'll tell you, we have people from Australia, from uh, Palestine, from South Africa. We have people everywhere from the Middle East. Um, it, just so you know, we have the most amount of downloads here in the United States. And then the second most downloaded um, country that downloads this podcast is Saudi Arabia. And I would not be surprised. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because your, the quality of your content is, is exceptionally high. Right. Uh, you approach a, uh, a very difficult subject in a very professional manner. So, and there are lots of very educated parents who are out there who want to be more informed. So, uh, because we're in the education business, we run an online school. Uh, I'll quickly give a plug in that you can find us. The name of our company is called Lincoln Method. Uh, so lincolnmethod.com. Um, and, uh, what we basically do is we provide private tutoring and now we're getting ready now that we're in, in finland we're getting ready to provide uh complete online schooling uh, certified accredited online schooling from finland now, and soon comprehensive sexual education absolutely and my biggest takeaway from this particular podcast and for the for the listeners who have uh, who, who have listened to the whole thing i I think that my biggest takeaway from this is to empower parents, right? To have intelligent discussions, not difficult discussions, right? And I think that uh, uh, we will, and I will, I think that I have to, first of all, practice this on myself, having two daughters myself, right? Who are, who are, who are going to be coming of age pretty soon. So I think that if I practice this on myself and then, you know, give you uh, my feedback, uh, you know, I think that that feedback would might be helpful for other parents who are in a similar situation, right? So that our kids learn about all of these things from us rather than, you know, from, uh, from their peers. And from the internet and from Dr. Google that doesn't always know all the correct answers and gives misinformation, right? When you don't know, Google is fantastic when you know what you're looking for, right? But when you don't know what you're looking for and you put in random things, it will get your answer will be very random. And you're not going to even know what to make of that answer. So the important thing for anyone that's listening is to make sure that when you get, when you listen to something, make sure it is evidence backed, science based, you know, fact checked, and that you get the proper information so that when you are teaching your children about comprehensive sexual education, you're providing the correct information and that there isn't any type of misinformation or that we're not giving our own judgment right or our own fears and that we're not passing those on but instead we're giving our children the correct information that they deserve and that it's important for them to know so that they can be sex positive and they can pass on sex positivity to the next generation so all right, Salim. Well, thank you so much. And for anyone that is interested and looking for online tutoring, be sure to check out lincolnmethod.com. They have excellent tutors and uh, will be, I'm sure, very happy to serve you in whatever country you are in. So thank you so much, Salim. And I appreciate your time with us. And I know that in Finland, it is now uh, approaching 1 a.m. So thank you so much for indulging us. <laughs> no, thank you <laughs> because for having me on, like on your podcast. Uh, of course. So while we are done here and it's been real and really intimate, and remember, this is not meant to be any type of medical advice. So if you're having any issues with your health, please 
seek out care with your healthcare provider. And until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Please be so kind to leave a review for the Muslim Sex Podcast. Five stars are always welcome and I would greatly appreciate it. And until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Thank you.